We are live, aren't we? Yes, I think so. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Five Questions Friday. My name is Daniel Williams. My pronouns are he, him, his. I'm the Minister for Spiritual Formation at St. Andrew's Presbyterian Church. Every Friday, as a program for spiritual formation, we have a conversation with an author, an activist, a scholar, a faith leader, an artist. And today, we are so lucky to be talking to Dr. Eric Servini. Hi, Eric. How are you? Hi, thanks for having me. Thank you. Eric, can you introduce yourself, your name, pronouns, anything else you want to know, you want sure. to see to? Yeah, Eric Servini, he, him, uh, originally from Austin, Texas, and started going to St. Andrews when I was, I think, one years old, and uh, it's been such a, a, a great part of my life since then. Yeah, we're so happy this is, we often have folks from outside the congregation part of this, and so it's nice to see someone who, is part of our extended St. Andrews family. Totally. And Eric, you have a book coming out next week, is that right? On Tuesday, yeah, so what, four or five days? <laughs> yeah. Tell us about it. Uh, so it's called The Deviance War, The Homosexual versus the United States of America, and it is the secret history of gay rights and queer liberation in America. And a lot of people think that uh, the the, fight for LGBTQ plus equality started with Stonewall, but this book really starts a generation before that, starting in the 1950s, uh, and really tells how Stonewall came to be and what was happening before that, because there was so much important activism in the, the decades before Stonewall that then uh, exploded in size after the riots and became what we now know as, as gay pride every June. Yeah, perfect timing, right? As June is about to start. Yep. So we're gonna, I'm gonna ask you my five questions about life and spirituality. And then I'm hoping folks will stay tuned at the end of that as you and I chat a little bit about queerness and faith and spirituality. How's that sound? Perfect. Great. So Eric, I wonder if you can start us off by telling us a little bit about someone who influenced on your journey to becoming who you are. I would have to say, I, some people may have already seen the video, but my mom, uh, the book is dedicated to her. Um, she's the one who started bringing me to Sunday school, who uh, became involved in St. Andrew's uh, social justice committee. I remember going and like reading Harry Potter while she was like working on these social justice issues. And I think she was the one who taught me that not only is social justice important, but it is synonymous with being a good Christian and being, you know, someone who is spiritual and who believes in you know the teachings of of jesus you have to be fighting for equality um and that's a big part of 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 my identity and my faith um and really everything that i learned about social justice and how to fight and and about activism i learned from her we were just talking right before the broadcast started about when your mom was arrested advocating for immigration justice. Yes. And I, I, there's so much synergy there with what you write about with civil disobedience mm -hmm. and Stonewall being a riot. And now as mm -hmm. we're seeing uprisings in Minneapolis and Louisville and other places, really remembering that that civil disobedience is part of the American tradition of justice speaking. It's really part of the Christian tradition. Certainly I think we can read uh, Jesus as civil dis civilly disobedient. Mm -hmm. So, um, Eric, what is your vocation and how do you know it? I think my vocation is first and foremost, telling stories. I think digging up stories from the past that have not been told and that have been erased from our history books, from our curricula, from popular culture, from Hollywood, um, there is so much in our past that has yet to be to be told, to be revealed to the world about struggles that not just we have gone through and our ancestors, but also people who are marginalized and forgotten, whether they're trans or people of color, who we are now standing on their shoulders. And I think recognizing how all of our struggles are interconnected and we have a moral obligation to the oppressed now because we have gay marriage, we have our rights because of 
the those with the least to lose were the ones who put their bodies on the line. You're seeing that right now in Minneapolis, you saw that at Stonewall. And so I think tracing these lines between different movements and different minority groups and different oppressed uh, uh, people is something that I, I enjoy doing. I, I enjoy discovering those connections in the archives and in, in, in you know, the personal papers and in, uh, you know, hidden deep in, in you know, FBI files. Um, and then, and then basically sifting through them and, and turning it into a story that's actually enjoyable to read. Um, that's, it's just my favorite thing to do. And it's just so incredibly rewarding. How did you discover that about yourself? I think the first time I entered the, an archive. So essentially it's almost the equivalent of if you passed away and gave the Library of Congress your Gmail password or your password to all your Facebook, all your social accounts, everything. So a lot of activists did the equivalent of that, except instead of you know emails and posts, they had letters and documents. And so one of those archives with hundreds of thousands of pages of documents was that of Dr. Frank Kameny, who's the, the main character in my book and con considered to be the grandfather of the gay rights movement, but not many people know his name. And so when you're physically touching these documents and seeing that this is the hidden history of gay rights in America that no one else in the world knows about, uh, or if they did or do, they you know um, have either forgotten it or they've passed away or they just don't have the platform or the resources to tell these stories. Um, that ability to see history and physically touch it, I think is, is really unique to being a historian. And I hope more students will experience that because you don't have to be a trained, you don't have to have a PhD to go into an archive and to, to witness history with your own eyes and with your own hands. And so I think that was that first time that I, I encountered in an archive is, is uh, probably when I realized, whoa, you know, I'm hooked. Oh, I love that. When do you feel most connected to something beyond yourself? I think very similarly, um, when I'm reading the papers of activists who have put their bodies on their line. So for example, reading the words of someone like Sylvia Rivera, who was created the first uh, trans organization in, in New York City. Before she did that, she was fighting for gay rights. Uh, her first organization was street transvestites for gay power because she understood that everyone's battle was interconnected. It wasn't until the Gay Activists Alliance and some of these early gay organizations essentially expelled her and refused to, to work with her because of the, you know, the, the image of a drag queen was seen as detrimental to the, to the homophile or the gay power cause that she said, okay, well, I'm gonna make this organization for, for, for trans folks instead. And so reading their words from that exact moment of them, you know, Sylvia getting arrested for gay power before her own trans organization existed and then getting forgotten, right? And seeing some of the tragedy in her own words and uh, in her colleagues like Marsha P. Johnson, and it reminds us that these people are actually human, right? We, we hear these names and we think, oh, you know, they did great things or, you know, oh, you know, Stonewall is great, but you forget they literally put their bodies on their line. They spent nights upon nights in jail um, living a nightmare so that we could have our rights. Um, and I think seeing that and seeing those accounts in their own words is when I feel most connected to our past because you understand that these are humans. They're not just statistics or stories from the past. These are people who were living authentic, complex lives. I, I grew up Presbyterian like you did, but I grew up in a very heavily Catholic area. And so I, I always felt a little bit disappointed that Presbyterians don't really do saints like our Catholic friends do. Mm -hmm. um, but we do do, Presbyterians, we believe that um, everyone who leads a life of justice and love and faith is a saint. And I, I love this like 
cloud of queer saints that you're that you're conjuring for us that um Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera and yeah. Greg Hamley, they're saints. They're when I think of saints, yeah. that's exactly who I think of. It's it's so interesting you use that word because one of the activists who is still alive is Randy Wicker, and he organized the very first gay rights picket in the country, I believe in the world. I still need to verify it, but in 1964, right? So five years before Stonewall, he was the one to organize it. He went to the University of Texas and he is the first to tell you now, he's 81 years old, uh, to tell you, I was a male chauvinist pig. I was transphobic. I, you know, saw uh, drag queens and gender non-conforming people as a threat to our movement because of how they would make us look to the straight uh, world. And now he, has made it his mission for the rest of his life at the age of 81 to fight for those who for, who fought for him, including Marsha P. Johnson. And the term he uses to describe people like Bayard Rustin, people like Marsha P. Johnson is a saint. And I think it works so well because sainthood, even if you're not, you don't believe literally that these people are, are saints, right? It's still a really useful term to understand uh, their their role and their importance in our in our mythology as a, a minority. Absolutely. Well, so I, from the way the conversation has gone so far, I have a guess as to the direction you're going to take this next question, but where do you find inspiration, Eric? <laughs> yeah, my original, my original response would be, it would be in history, but I think also, you know, in the work that is being done right now. So many people, especially in the, this, the middle of a pandemic, it's easy to forget that there are still people fighting for us and fighting for those who are most marginalized and as a result are most affected by the pandemic. And so for example, you know, the Sylvia Rivera uh, Law Project in New York, they're still doing their jobs. Uh, the, the American Civil Liberties Union is still fighting for trans children in Idaho. Um, these are organizations that need our help. And I think right now um, to see that they're still fighting for us and still fighting for our community in the middle of this pandemic where everyone's just kind of out for themselves right now and, and isolated and alone, it's, it's easy to forget that we are part of something larger and we are a part of an interconnected struggle. And so I think right now, you know, we're, we're two, three days out from, from Pride Month as people are trying to figure out, all right, well, I'm not gonna be spending my money on a circuit party. I'm not gonna be spending my money at a gay bar on $15 vodka sodas. What can I do with that money instead, right? Even if it's coming from an unemployment check. Well, let's look at some of the, you know, the uh, uh, Transgender Law Center. Let's look at the ACLU, uh, the Sylvia Rivera Law Project. There are so many, uh, uh, organizations that are doing the hard work, getting on the ground, bailing out people in Minneapolis, in Louisville, um, that need our help. And they are an inspiration to me, and I wanna do everything I can to to uh, uh, elevate them. I love I love the sort of pivot from the past to the present. I think a lot of, a lot of us who don't study history professionally are used to this idea of like, oh, well, there's, there's history and that's this thing that's over. And then there's the present that we're experiencing. Um, and to go back to our conversation about saints, one of the things that saints do in Roman Catholic theology is connect the human and the divine. And so mm -hmm. I think in a similar way, they connect the past and the present. And so that we're the mm -hmm. continuous stream of, of faith. And so it's an unbroken line. It's a, it's a convoluted line and a stressful mm -hmm. line from mm -hmm. the homophiles to us, but, I love I love you lifting up the ways that we can be continuing their work and improving on it. Mm -hmm. Exactly, and I think you know history is a template for what is happening right now. Um, it teaches us lessons for the present, but also we have to remember that we are creating history right now. And just as we are judging our ancestors for their own mistakes, future generations will be judging us. And so our silence right now uh, in, in, uh, in response to what is happening in Minneapolis um, 
and elsewhere in this country will be remembered. And I think this is an opportunity for us, especially as an LGBTQ plus community, as part of a, a church going community to say, we're not gonna let history judge us for being silent. Mm -hmm. Amen. Well, and that kind of brings me to my last question, which is that everything is stressful right now. There's a lot of <laughs> uncertainty and chaos and, and grief. And so in the midst of all of that, where do you find hope? I, I get this question a lot because studying the past and studying LGBT history of the past, is it, it, it can be pretty dark, mm -hmm. uh, but these people persisted, right? Frank Kameny, Bayard Rustin, Ernestine Eppinger, Barbara Giddings, they kept going until the very last breath. And I think to remember that we have been through dark times before. The 1960s, I think, are probably one of the better equivalents of what we're undergoing now. Instead of it being a pandemic and a virus, it was the threat of nuclear annihilation, right? So we had the, you know, uh, uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis. People really didn't know whether or not their cities would still exist the next day. Um, you know, leaders were getting assassinated, um, whether they were presidents or Martin Luther King. Uh, it was a really, really scary time. Churches were being blown up on the regular, but after that, you know, the year after the, 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 the church bombing, the year after the dogs in Birmingham, you have tangible signs of progress. You have the 64 Civil Rights Bill, the 65 Voting Rights Act. There was successes. And that is something that we need to remember that dark times will produce uh, brighter times in the future if we take advantage of this moment to actually come together and to fight back uh, and to demand change. And we have to remember it's an election year, right? This could be the year where we said enough is enough. This regime, this administration is not reflective of me and my identity as a Christian or as someone who is committed to social justice. So I'm gonna do everything in my power to make sure that, that we have a change in, in government. Thank you so much, Eric. And now, so I normally get to ask the questions and don't have to- I know, I, <laughs> I, I think you have some questions for me. Yes, <laughs> and thank you for that, for being so flexible because I, 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 you know, always get questions from, you know, people on my page about, you know, anytime I mention something about faith or like the history of, you know, the Bible and some of how the evolution of, of you know, homosexuality as sin, you know, people would say, so what? Why do you care what the Bible says? And so I was so excited um, when you asked to, to interview me that maybe I could kind of turn the question back on you. Um, and one of the questions that I got when I mentioned uh, that we were gonna be doing this interview from uh, one of our followers said, as a very lapsed Catholic and as a gay man, I've never been able to reconcile Christianity in any form with my identity. Why should or why would I embrace a faith that has been used to attack me, vilify me, indeed to destroy me if possible, and all of my LGBTQ plus extended family in the world? So a big question, but I think, you know, I I think you're probably better equipped to answer that as someone who, you know, is is a minister yourself. Well, it, it is a big question. It's a really good question. Um, and I, I don't think you can start to answer it without saying that um, as a queer person, as a Christian, I grieve and I'm frankly really angry at the church um, that harmed this this person and the, the and all of the harm that the church has done to queer people and to lots of people over history. And and to first of all, just, just acknowledge and name that the church sucks a lot of the time and that that there can be no reconciliation, there can be no comfort without first being really honest about that. And I think that's something that the church itself knows that when we talk about forgiveness, which is a big theme in Christianity, part of that is always repentance. And so the church has a lot of repenting to do. And the church in, in a lot of places is doing that. And it also mm -hmm. still isn't. And so I wanna name that like, um, 
not a, not every queer person is fortunate to ha- have a relationship uh, with faith that is not severely wounded mm-hmm. by by the church. Um, and I think along with that has to be said by me, my belief is that that is a scandal to the gospel. That is a betrayal of Christ mm. um, who told us that whatever you do to the least of these, you do unto me. And so when the church has said that you're going to hell, when the church has called you um, a sinner, when the church has called you deplorable, when the, whatever the church has said to you, whatever the church has done to you, they were harming Christ in harming mm-hmm. you. And that you, no amount of queerness, no amount of questions or doubts or wounds can, can erase the light of Christ in you, can erase the image of God that has been with you since the beginning. And if we believe that each one of us was made in the image of God, then I know deep in my bones that God is queer. Super, super queer. I love that. Um, and so I, I will say that I don't, I don't think that anyone should rec- should become a Christian. If you, if you want to be a Christian, if you, if this is the direction that you're being drawn to, I think being open to it is important, but your questioner said, why should I reconcile with Christianity? Girl, don't like you're better than us probably. <laughs> um, but if I think all of our faith is between us and, and the divine Mm. and you don't need the church. You don't, we need you. (laughs) We need you to suck less. We need you to, to be, to stop being the church that wounded you. We need you so that we can do better by the next generation. And so like, you know, I don't, I don't know any gay people who were, harmed by the church if they grew up in it. And I Mm -hmm. certainly was. And um, the reason I I stayed in the church isn't because I think the church is awesome. And the reason I stay in the church is because I think the church sucks a lot of the times. And my personal calling was to make the church suck less. Mm -hmm. And I'm not doing that. Um, Mm -hmm. But that's not everybody's calling. Right. so, um, So... I would say, don't worry about reconciling with the church. Don't worry about reconciling with Christianity. Know that you are loved. Know that you are holy. Know that your life matters. Know that nothing could make you less sacred. And once you know that, you don't need the church. The church needs you. And so that's, you know, I, I, I think that maybe I'm supposed to say like, Oh, you know, Christianity is not all bad. It's not, but people experience it that way. Mm-hmm. And and so I, I think that people, um, I, I don't think that Christianity is more valid than people's experience without Christianity. I think that a lot mm-hmm. of a lot of folks who had their beliefs um, fractured and broken down by the church's queer phobia. Um, what they're able to build from from the remnants of that is way more beautiful, way more authentic, way more holy than an unquestioning faith, even if it doesn't use words like Jesus and grace. Mm-hmm. And like those words aren't important. What's important is love and compassion and peace. Right, right. I I think that's so well said, and I'm like <laughs> I'm feeling extremely moved by by that. And I think so many people, you know, maybe were raised in a, a family or a household that you know were part of a church that was not inclusive. And I think if there's anything that my personal relationship with uh, my faith with Scripture has been that we must be inclusive. And I think, you know, St. Andrews has taught me that the words of Jesus were, were radical. Right. And I think your, your description of God as being a queer, like why not? And I think uh, separating the institution from, of, of the church from uh, my personal relationship with 
my faith has been such an important realization that they don't have to be grouped together. It's not like a two for one. Like I can have my own personal relationship um, with with spirituality or God. And so I think um, the way you said it is, is just perfect. Um, so thank you so much for that. Yeah, thank you. And um, I will say that there's there's been a lot written um, by queer Christians about this. And so I would encourage folks uh, but of course, I didn't come with any book recommendations, but I'll, I'll comment some on the video. I was going to say, if you wouldn't mind, wouldn't mind um, uh, commenting, maybe if some resources, um, I know I was going to mention like the very first time I ever heard of anything being gender inclusive, right, or being, you know, non-binary was from St. Andrews, right? So I was very lucky, you know, the, the Bible that, that, um, I was taught was a gender inclusive Bible that didn't say kingdom, it said kingdom. Yeah. Uh, and I think that in itself, there are pockets within the world of faith, uh, including St. Andrews and other, other churches who are doing the hard work. Um, I'll never forget uh, the very first AIDS memorial I went to back in, it must've been the nineties was at St. Andrews, where it was literally a field of crosses for those who passed away of AIDS. And that was a church that did that. So I want people to know that if faith is important to you, and if you do have that desire to, you know, continue that, that tradition, there are families who want you with open arms. And Daniel, you're, you're part of that family and leading one of them. So I want to thank you for doing that for us. And the last thing I'll say about that, Eric, is that queer people in general, and queer Christians in particular, have always known how to build their own communities. We've known how to build our own families. We've known how to build our own churches. And so some of the churches that are doing the best in this pandemic, now that we can't meet in person, are the the churches that have queer people in charge. Really? Um, <laughs> that <yeah>. makes sense. <laughs> like, I've been in part of a queer community online, a queer community of faith online since I was in college. We, don't, we meet together maybe once a year. Um, and so you might not be able to find, if you want a church, uh, you might not be able to find one that's queer inclusive in your community that's right for you, but there are queer inclusive churches all over the country and I'm not trying to promote St. Andrews, like check out St. Andrews if you want. You don't have to live in Austin to watch our services, but but take that, take that curiosity and, you know, or make your own spiritual community. Mm. You don't, you don't need, <laughs> I feel like I'm really being very cynical about the church right now as someone who gets paid full time to work for one. Um, <laughs> but you're, 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 you're the one who can, uh, <laughs> who has the, uh, the, you know, the ticket to do that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, um, really, and I, I, um, yeah, I just, I, I hope that every queer person who watches this, I don't, I don't care if you come away liking Christianity or not. Like I really, like I said, I don't. Um, but I, I hope that every queer person hears that I believe that God loves them and that I believe that they were made perfect and beautiful and that their queerness is one of the most holy and sacred things about them. Oh. Well, on that note, thank you so much for having me. I, this, this has been such a special conversation and I, I, it means a lot to have to have this, especially from someone in my in my hometown. And St. Andrews has been such a good family to me. Um, so thank you. Thank you, Eric. And can you tell us the name of your book one more time? Sure. <laughs> I know I'm being a terrible salesperson. Um, I should have it somewhere. It's The Deviant's War, <laughs> The Homosexual versus the United States of America. And it's out Tuesday, but you can pre-order it. We're sending um, uh, gifts to anyone who, who pre-orders it with a little signed uh, book plate that you can stick in it since I can't physically sign it because of social distancing. You can stick this right in your book and it becomes immediately signed. <laughs> Perfect. Well, thank you so much. And folks, uh, tune in next week for another Five Questions Friday. Perfect. Thanks so much, Daniel. Thank you. Bye, y'all.